Good afternoon, President Sullivan, university faculty, fellow students, and honored guests. My name is Tierney Vile, and it is my privilege to welcome you all to graduation weekend. We may have been spotlighted as individuals on the lawn before, admittedly in slightly different attire. But today, we come together in this space to celebrate our collective accomplishments and to look toward the future. If nothing else, please sit back and enjoy the beautiful architecture. It's no secret that Jefferson loved architecture. He said, architecture is worth great attention. He said, it is among the most important arts and it is desirable to introduce taste into an art that shows so much. And reflecting upon our time on these grounds, architecture provides a handy metaphor for how this university has introduced taste and learning into us. Different buildings from around grounds can represent each of our four years and point us towards the future. First year, we are Clemens Library, still aching from those goodbye hugs with our parents and full of ideas of what college will be like from Facebook, we are quarantined behind Special Collection and Alderman Library. Quite literally put into the corner of grounds until you can learn how to master that fabled work-play balance and the bus routes. Midnight still seems thrillingly late when the announcement comes on that Clemens Library will now be closed to the general public transforming your study space into an exclusive retro nightclub, complete with fish tanks like all the top European raves. You make it rain with those plus dollars, buying that late night pizza for the whole club. Like descending the floors in Clemens, you gain focus and intellectual prowess as the year wears on. By spring, you might not be pre-med anymore, but you have your own cleverly named Facebook albums full of the faces of people that you are beginning to realize will be your lifelong friends. Along comes second year. We are transformed into a building that is innovative, yet oddly transparent. I'm speaking, of course, of N2. <laughs> Shaken to our core by deadlines for declaring a major and Hurricane Sandy, Second year was full of choices that determined our undergraduate careers. We carefully completed applications to the Calm School, to Batten, and to leadership positions in our clubs. Like the architects who created N2, second year urged us to enter these new majors and organizations, but to always think outside of the box, or at least to make that box out of glass so that you could feel like you were not in one. Third year, we became a space much more suitable for leadership. The amphitheater. The amphitheater is a space to gather, a place to enjoy symphony under the stars, or to rally as a community to create change. As leaders of spring break trips and various clubs, we found ourselves on the stage in many ways. Yet critical to our performance was a compassion for our audience and our fellow players. With initiatives like the Handprint Project and Honor Referenda, we bettered our community of trust and strove to end sexual violence. We nominated friends for the Good Guy Room on the Lawn, for scholarships, and for Love Connection. With fingers crossed for internships, we rounded the corner into our final year at the University of Virginia. Fourth year came, and the class of 2015 became the one, the only, the Rotunda. Yet, at the tender age of 22, we've had some pretty heavy cosmetic work done. <laughs> Closed to the public, but under constant observation, we underwent complicated renovations to better ourselves for the real world. Our university, too, has experienced much observation and tragedies this year. Like the construction on the Rotunda, the healing from losing Hannah Graham, efforts to make campus safe from sexual assault, 
and ensuring racial equality will take complex reformations and much more than two years. It's very difficult to leave a place we so love in the thick of change, but we are privileged to know the peers in whose hands we leave these renovations. On behalf of the class of 2015, we assure you that they are our friends and that there are no better architects to better our community of trust. Scaffolding did not prevent us from lighting of the lawn, and graduating will not prevent us from continuing to be a part of the changes that are underway at this university. We leave Virginia our gratitude and blueprints for continuing to be a haven for the illimitable freedom of the human mind. And we take with us a love for learning from peers in our surroundings as much as from any book. It will be impossible to ever truly leave this place and these friends that we so love. Fortunately, Mr. Jefferson and certainly the Alumni Association have no intentions of letting us do anything of the sort. Jefferson refused to even call this weekend graduation. He instead used the title Final Exercises because he thought you could never really graduate from learning. Class of 2015, it's in the years following these final exercises that we will truly appreciate the opportunities that our University of Virginia education has offered us. Our time here has changed the architecture of who we are. And so we may say, in our reverence, in our thankfulness, that we have worn the honors of honor and graduated from Virginia. Congratulations, class of 2015, and wahoo wah. Each year, the Algernon Sidney Sullivan Award Committee selects one man and one woman from the graduating class who best exemplify the highest qualities of Algernon Sidney Sullivan's life. The committee also selects an individual from the university community whose compassion, service, and influence is widely acknowledged and appreciated. All of the recipients of this award possess fine spiritual qualities, practically applied in their daily living. They are distinctly defined by their acts. Their deeds are not spent on their self-interests, but rather in the interest of community and humankind. They represent our highest ideals and our greatest hopes. Please hold your applause until after I have read all three citations. Our female Algernon Sidney Sullivan Award recipient is Hawa Ahmed, a woman who walks with a quiet grace and attends to the needs of others unasked. Indeed, her seemingly tireless concern for students, faculty, and staff senses crises before they strike. And we on the Algernon Sidney Sullivan Committee have learned from her closest friends that the virtues that give rise to this rare talent are the exact same that lead her to avoid the spotlight. Such strength of character produces the very best leaders. When we found our university community in crisis this past year, Hawa acted immediately with force, dedication, and candor. As co-chair of the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Prevention Team, she spoke eloquently and knowledgeably to the Board of Visitors and to the broader university community about how to make our university safer for all. Her leadership on the Sexual Misconduct Board was unmatched and in the wake of the Rolling Stone article, her voice was clear, grave, consoling, and persistent. Never was she rancorous, always was she honest. These are but two of the many organizations to which she gave so very much of her time. One of Hawa's best traits is her willingness to identify problems and then dedicate herself to the work of solving them. She does not allow herself to spend time complaining but instead throws her energy into improving the community around her, with an eye toward improving the experiences of others. Hawa exhibited this trait through her work with the Office of Undergraduate Admission and her time as a resident advisor, working tirelessly to make the university a friendly, more welcoming place for incoming students. Hawa leaves the university having taught us many lessons, but her greatest lesson is what it means to be a humble leader. 
For this and much more, she is so aptly recognized as this year's female Algernon Sidney Sullivan Award recipient. Though he attained one of the most prestigious positions a UVA student can hold and executed the office with grace, style, and perfection, the University Judiciary Committee Chair, Tim Kimball, this year's male Algernon Sidney Sullivan Award recipient, went out of his way to stay out of the limelight. Throughout this year of excellent leadership, Tim seemed even to dislike the attention he deserved, as if it simply distracted from the important work at hand. When he did speak out, it was always to feature the great work of others and the university's tradition of student self-governance. It is our great pleasure to honor him now. Tim demonstrated the same quiet leadership in his role of resident advisor. The praises he won from his residents is simply unprecedented. He always knew who was in need, and he stayed with him or her until all was well. One first-year student in peril commented that he would have transferred to another, to another school were it not for Tim's counsel and abiding friendship. Tim is a responsible leader, a conscientious university citizen, and a dependable friend. Despite his many accomplishments, he is never too busy to look out for those around him or to help a friend in need, and he somehow manages to have a perpetual smile on his face. Tim has made the University of Virginia a better place through his presence here as a student. Tim leaves the university having modeled what it means to be a mature, humble, and thoughtful student leader. For this, and for his many outstanding qualities, we are honored to present to him the 2015 Male Algernon Sidney Sullivan Award. For nearly two decades, University of Virginia students have had no greater advocate, counselor, friend, or healer than Dean Nicole Aramo, this year's community recipient of the Algernon Sidney Sullivan Award. A woman of dignity, honor, loyalty, and utter courage, she responds to students' needs in a moment's notice and stays with them, the ordeal and its duration notwithstanding. Her ability to balance rules and procedures with heart and compassion is uncanny, and her energy and savvy are seemingly inexhaustible. Her virtues fit perfectly with a job that demands more than one can give. Nicole is selfless, professional, accessible, and unwavering in her support of students. She has made people's lives deeply better in ways she will never mention and we will never know about. She is all in, all the time, modeling a unique balance of strength and selflessness. People value her advice, seek out her opinion, and trust her moral compass. When a situation becomes difficult, she doesn't walk away, she doesn't delegate, she quietly and without being asked, takes on more responsibility. She walks into the fire, she listens to students, and she responds to questions, and even criticism, with patience and without anger. Dina Ramo stood on the front lines of this past year's controversies. Only she and her husband, Kurt, knew, know the full cost, but this community knows that she came out the champion. She will forever have our heart, and we will forever have her back. The Algernon Sidney Sullivan Award is for those diligent university leaders who avoid the spotlight. Dean Nicole Aramo does not so much avoid the spotlight, she just doesn't seem to know that there is one. She has no time for it. She moves at the speed of love. Please join me in congratulating uh, this year's award recipients.
At Valediction each year, the Seven Society presents two unique awards, the Lewis A. Honesty Memorial Scholar Athlete Award and the James Earl Sargent Award, which are given annually to an outstanding student athlete and a student organization that make major contributions to the university community. This year, the Lewis A. Honesty Memorial Scholar Athlete Award recipient is Jordan Lavender, a member of the women's track and field team. Originally from Nashville, Tennessee, Jordan is double majoring in media studies and Spanish in the College of Arts and Sciences. An incredible student athlete coming out of high school, Jordan graduates as one of the most decorated track and field athletes in Virginia history. A varsity sprinter all four years, Jordan broke records her first year in the 60 meter, 200 meter, 300 meter, and 400 meter indoor races. Over her career, she has been honored as a nine time all ACC honoree, a three time ACC champion, a two time ACC championships MVP, and a 2014 NCAA All American. Jordan is not only an unbelievably talented athlete, she excels off the track as well. She has served as a student athlete mentor for three years and is committed to the well being of her teammates. Jordan has also been actively involved in Who Vision an organization dedicated to providing opportunities for students to practice video interviewing skills with other student athletes. In 2013, she was named to the All-ACC academic team as well as to the All-Academic team by the U.S. Track and Field and Cross Country Coaches Association. When asked about Jordan, track and field coach Brian Fetzer claims, she is one of the most coachable athletes I've ever had, and I would love to have a team of Jordans, but I'm sure she is one of a kind. After graduation, Jordan plans to use her ACC Weaver James Corgan postgraduate scholarship to stay at the university and pursue a professional career in track and field. For her personal, academic, and athletic achievements and contributions to the university, I'm honored to present the Lewis A. Honesty Memorial Scholar Athlete Award to Jordan Lavender. She is currently in Tallahassee, Florida, competing in the ACC championship meet, but her friend is here to accept the award on her behalf. This year, the James Earl Sargent Award goes to Sustained Dialogue. Sustained Dialogue engages students in weekly dialogue to examine difficult subjects, including race, gender, and identity, among others. Their purpose is to bring together, through dialogue, diverse perspectives at UVA to create an open and accepting community where each individual is valued and respected. This has never been more important or necessary for our community than it has been this year. In addition to normal weekly dialogues for their members, Sustained Dialogue worked with many organizations around grounds over the past year to hold open dialogues for the entire university community. They partnered with the Honor Committee to hold a discussion about the single sanction. Additionally, following the release of the Rolling Stone article, they co-hosted a student-only open dialogue with one less and one in four to discuss feelings that arose from the article, as well to talk to students about how they could combat sexual assault on grounds. They also worked with the administration to hold a dialogue on community. These are just a few of the examples of the many ways that sustained dialogue has been thoughtfully productive. They provided a space for students to work through issues the community has faced and kept important conversations going in a positive manner. Accepting the award on behalf of sustained dialogue is Caroline Parker. Caroline served as the chair of sustained dialogue this past year and is a graduating fourth year student. Caroline, please come forward to accept the James Earl Sargent Award. year, the trustees of the graduating class bestow three awards upon graduating students who have contributed significantly to the university. The Award for Community Service, the Award for Cultural Fluency, and this year, the Ripple Effect Award. Since 1993, the trustees of the graduating class have recognized one graduating student who has made service central to his or her life through a commitment to bettering the lives of others 
and inspiring peers to do the same. This year, we are honored to present the Award for Community Service to Katie Bailey. Outside of pursuing a double major in Spanish and urban and environmental planning, Katie has spent much of her time at UVA heavily involved in Relay for Life, an organization that works to raise awareness and funds in the fight against cancer. Having served on Relay for Life's executive board since her first year, Katie's dedication has completely invigorated and grown UVA's Relay program during her four years on grounds. This past year, Katie served as co-chair for the entire Relay for Life organization, through which she helped lead Relay to cumulatively raise over $1 million for cancer research. Her efforts also helped Relay for Life earn Best Philanthropic Event at UVA this year. In fact, Katie was the number one collegiate fundraiser in the nation. To put some concrete numbers on it, she raised over $23,000 in just 72 hours. In addition to leading the most successful philanthropy at UVA, Katie served as a program director for Madison House directing CAVs in the classroom. She also served as a student mentor for UVA PALS, a volunteer for ESOL, and a member of the UVA Sustainability Committee. In her dedication to service at UVA, Katie constantly went above and beyond her duties in each and every role, helping to grow the entire service community at the university. Katie, we would like to thank you for your generous contributions to the university and the Relay for Life community and commend you for your selfless service. Katie, will you please come forward to accept the award for community service? Since 1996, the trustees of the graduating class have recognized one graduating student who has demonstrated an understanding of and appreciation for cultural and intellectual diversity during their time at the university. This year's award goes to Chung Tran. During his time on grounds, Chung passionately engaged the world around him on many levels across numerous disciplines. Even as a biomedical engineer, Chung has dedicated many aspects of his life and time at UVA to helping understand and enrich the cultures around him. At UVA, Chung was the culture chair of the Vietnamese Student Association and an active member of the Korean Student Association. As culture chair, he organized many events, such as the Tet Show, a cultural exposition that showcased a Vietnamese musical act, traditional Vietnamese dances, and a skit designed to help the Vietnamese Student Association educate the community and celebrate Vietnamese culture. Trung also served as the president of the Pride Lion Dance at UVA, a student organization aimed at promoting aspects of traditional Asian culture through performances. As one of the founding members of the Pride during his early years at the university, Trung established and helped grow an organization of students who performed the traditional Chinese lion dance at many events, as well as in Charlottesville schools. His tireless and committed work in this group demonstrated his admiration for and appreciation of other cultures. He also attended events organized by groups such as the Black Student Alliance, manifesting his concern about issues that affect all types of people and cultures, even if he is not personally included within them. Chong has demonstrated his cultural fluency and helped to increase this knowledge for those around him. The world will be a better place because of ambition, ambitious and welcoming people like Chong Tran. Chong, 
Will you please come forward to accept the award for cultural fluency? Every year, the trustees of the graduating class have the ability to create an award to represent a core value that characterizes the class. This year, the Ripple Effect Award was established with the, effect, with the intent of recognizing just how effective one person can be in making this university a better place for his or her peers. This year's award goes to Ashley Blackwell. Ashley's passion and work has improved the lives of people within and beyond our own community. She inspired other people to fight for causes and to stand for what they believe in. A perfect example was her effort to launch the Rainey Scholars Mentorship Network for almost 100 students at UVA, with the goal of connecting first-year students to academic, organizational, and professional opportunities. She plans to expand this network to Blue Ridge scholars and access UVA beneficiaries. Ashley also emphasized the need to give back to communities around her and changed the landscape for low-income students at UVA. She is currently fundraising to develop a scholarship for low-income students to take advantage of unpaid summer internships. Additionally, she founded United for Undergraduate Socioeconomic Diversity. Furthermore, she acted as the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Restore Access UVA campaign to ensure that low-income students can access the same opportunities that were afforded to her. She influenced her peers by creating an open dialogue for affected peers, making them a part of the conversation that they were not involved in before. Ashley, your dedication and commitment to bringing unacknowledged issues to light have truly made a ripple effect on this university and its surrounding communities. You are an inspiring catalyst who initiates tangible change and simultaneously influences the attitudes and outlooks of those around you. With the utmost respect, the Ripple Effect Award goes to Ashley Blackwell. Will you please come forward to accept this award? Every year, uh, the Society of the Purple Shadows hands out uh, the Gordon F. Rainey Award for Vigilance to the Student Experience. And uh, they've asked me to read this letter uh, to Mr. John Colley, and it reads, Mr. Colley, it may be in a futile attempt that the Society of the Purple Shadows recognizes you today. The swath of acclaim of which your colleagues and students, your friends, know you to be worthy exists at the university almost unto itself. The name John Colley is as Virginia as the bricks and columns that surround the man. To attempt to articulate your qualities anew is a daunting task. And yet the difficulty of lauding you in a way that the countless others have not already is commensurate only with the amount of praise you deserve. Since you arrived at the university, you have exemplified the most important characteristic for which the Gordon F. Rainey Jr. Award was established, vigilance to the student experience. It seems only fitting, then, that we requested one of your best and favorite students read to you this letter. Perhaps the clearest instantiation of your caring stewardship of students at the university is also the most immediate, your residence in Pavilion 8 on the historic lawn. You invite among many thankful guests, not only your students from Darden, but also undergraduates 
and fellow members of your beloved Raven Society into your home at all hours to eat, drink, and think. Whether perusing the words of Plato and Emerson or unpacking one of the over 300 Darden case studies you authored, your students are equally charmed and challenged. Yes, here is the university and its academical village as Mr. Jefferson intended, the happy dissemination and exchange of knowledge in a beautiful place. Indeed, your presence at the university is too great and varied to pen easily a pithy note of thanks for your incomparable tenure here. So we appeal to the philosophy of Emerson, which you understand and manifest, manifest so profoundly. Cause and effect, means and ends, seed and fruit cannot be severed. For the effect already blooms in the cause, the end pre-exists in the means, the fruit in the seed. We do not thank you now for your doings at the university. Too many tongues have already spoken thus. Rather, we thank you for being an individual who truly comprises this place, the fruit and the seed, unseverable. For you, Mr. Colley, are one the university is proud to call her own. Society of the Purple Shadows. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Ann Self, and this is my co-chair of this year's class giving campaign, Ben Colalillo. <laughs> Noted writer and activist Maya Angelou said, one must not just know how to accept a gift, but with what grace to share it. I wanted to start out with this quote so that we could reflect on the incredible gift that we've been given, that is to attend the University of Virginia. Given this great opportunity, it is now our duty to help sustain and enhance the university experience. One way our class has and will continue to do this is through our gifts back to the university. As many of you know, the class giving campaign allows us as fourth year students to give back to any organization on grounds that has made an impact on us. This year, 61% of the graduating class made a donation to their department, Access EVA, or any of the hundreds of CIOs that have made our time at UVA special. Congratulations and thank you for the tremendous impact your gifts have made and will continue to make. We hope you will consider giving back to the university for years to come. If you have yet to give or still need to fulfill your pledge, you can do so on the Class of 2015 website. Last week, when we printed the ceremonial check, the total amount raised was $295,047. Over the last few days, members of the class of 2015 donated an additional $200,000, bringing our grand total to $495,047. President Sullivan, on behalf of the class of 2015, we are pleased to present you with our class gift.
Well, thank you, Ms. Self, Mr. Kalilo. It was quite a week. Uh, a very impressive gift. The class of 2015 did a remarkable job. I'm very grateful for your generosity, but also for the many ways that your gift will enhance the university. Trustees of the class of 2015 are continuing the one-year undesignated gift program adopted by the class of 1997. The class gift has become a tradition here. This program offers each student the opportunity to make a cash gift and to direct it to the areas of the university most meaningful to him or her. More than 400 programs benefited from the generosity of this class. The giving is broadly distributed across the university. This year, the class gift will benefit various schools and departments, the university library, Madison House, the Office of African American Affairs, the Women's Center, the Fralin Museum of Art, 50 sorority and fraternity foundations, and more than 250 student organizations, the Virginia Athletics Foundation, the Rotunda Renovation Project, and Access UVA, the university's financial aid program. I hope that your interest in and support for these programs will continue through the years. The 2,068 members of the class and counting who participated in the class giving campaign with donations and pledges will leave an enduring mark on the university. It will strengthen us and it will remind us of the generous spirit of the class of 2015. Among the many events scheduled this weekend are ROTC commissioning exercises. This afternoon, members of the class of 2015 who have chosen to serve our country in the Army, Marines, Navy, and Air Force receive their commissions. When you see our graduating students in uniform this weekend, I hope you will congratulate them and thank them for their willingness to serve our country. And thank you all for being here today to celebrate this important milestone for our students. Friends, now we have a day or two before we process down this lawn and leave this undergraduate adventure behind us. So while we celebrate the closing of this chapter today, we must also begin to embrace the future set before us. Before we confidently move forward into the next step of our lives, let's take some time to thank those who made all this possible. Here in a city that has welcomed us into her community, we find ourselves incredibly fortunate to have the support of so many. Our lack of regrets and abundance of memories is in no small part due to these people who have contributed to our success and led us to this moment. So first, a thank you to the tireless individuals who kept our buildings and grounds looking beautiful. Whether it was those who ensured we always had a clean place to sit in the dining hall so we could have a plate of everything or maintained our world-renowned libraries in such a condition that every guest was jealous of where we wrote our papers the night before they were due, or manicured the lawn and our gardens so we always had that picturesque backdrop. These members are the butt kickers of our university, and we are grateful for all that you do. Next, a gracious thanks to the administrators at the university. We first felt your support four years ago when you granted us admission and you've stood by us ever since. That acceptance letter was a great first move. 
but the continued encouragement, reinsurance, and inspiration you've shared with us is nothing short of remarkable. You opened the university to us, and for that, and were there for us every step of the way. And for that, we will always be indebted to you. Additionally, a thank you to the professors who challenged us to work harder than we played, to think and open our minds, and for giving us the chance to explore our academic passions while guiding us to success. You have given our degrees meaning and our minds a footing for the next segment of our lives. Thank you for the Dutch knockouts, the curves, and for always having your office doors and even your homes open to us. And now, a huge, unashamed, loving thank you to those we call family. Our brothers and sisters, our moms and dads, and all those we call our loved ones. You've seen us at our best, and you've loved us through our worst. Over the years, we might not have called as often as we should. We might have spent a Mother's Day or four down at the beach. <laughs> and maybe you felt like you were always the last ones to hear of what we were doing for the summer and for the rest of our lives after college. But we do love you. We love you more than any words I can say. And we want to say thank you, now more than ever, for everything you've done for us up to today. We know your love and support won't end anytime soon. So once more, thank you for everything and all the things you've done. And last but not least, class of 2015, we thank you. We thank our hallmates, our roommates, our apartment mates, our housemates, our classmates, and our regular old mates that we never got to live with. Together, we've survived some tough years at the university, but we've grown closer all because of it. But today, we embark on a new journey together, committed to using our grateful hearts and our selfless minds and making this world a better place. While we won't walk down this lawn as one big family tomorrow or on Sunday, we are here now and will always be the class of 2015. And no amount of construction fencing can change that. So thank you, friends, for the best four years of my life. And wahoo wah, class of 2015, we did it. class of 2015, faculty, and guests. My name is Danielle Ager, and as this year's graduation chair, I have the great privilege of getting to stand between you and Ed Helms. <laughs> Most of you are likely familiar with Mr. Helms's work, but I invite you to take a moment to imagine what Mr. Helms's college experience might have been like had he been a member of the class of 2015 at the University of Virginia. A highly accomplished comedian and performer, Mr. Helms moved to New York City after graduating from Oberlin College in 1996, immediately immersing himself in improv, sketch, and stand-up comedy. Seizing every available opportunity to perform, Mr. Helms was not too unlike an eager first year at the August Activities Fair, keen to join every comedy CIO listserv. However, unlike most of our class, who has still not removed themselves from those unread email threads, Mr. Helms' dedication to pursuing his dream led him to study with the Upright Citizens Brigade and eventually landed him a coveted correspondence role on The Daily Show with Don, John Stewart. Following his time on The Daily Show, Mr. Helms joined NBC's hit comedy The Office in the role of Andy Bernard. As an overenthusiastic, a cappella loving, preppy college alum, it's not hard to imagine Mr. Helms' nard dog fully embracing the UVA guys and ties tradition while running to and from a cappella practice. After all, Mr. Helms has already performed with our very own hullabahoos while on the office, so we know he'd fit right in. Mr. Helms has also enjoyed countless successes on the big screen, including Were the Millers, The Lorax, Cedar Rapids, and perhaps most notably, his role as Stu, the good intention but misfortune dentist from the hit Hangover trilogy the first installment of which won the 2010 Golden Globe for Best Picture, Comedy or Musical. But just like any true Wahoo, Mr. Helms' talents are multifaceted and extend beyond his on-screen and comedic accolades. A lifelong musician, Mr. Helms plays a killer banjo in his bluegrass band, The Lonesome Trio, 
who likely would have been known as those students always jamming out on the lawn between classes at UVA. Mr. Helms has worked to bring his love of music to others, founding the LA Bluegrass Situation, a music festival in Los Angeles, as well as its sister website, thebluegrasssituation.com. Given Mr. Helms' myriad talents and his passion and dedication to everything he commits himself to, I think it's safe to say that had Mr. Helms attended the University of Virginia, he would have been given the rotunda to live in fourth year, as a mere lawn room would not have sufficed. We are honored to have such an accomplished speaker with us today, someone who has not only sought excellence in his performing career, but in all of his endeavors. Mr. Helms, on behalf of the class of 2015 and the University of Virginia, I would like to thank you for being here with us today. And so, without further ado, the man you've all been waiting for, Mr. Ed Helms. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I had no idea I am that awesome. Uh, <laughs> greetings, students, distinguished faculty, parents, and Homer's ass. <laughs> First off, I want to say it's great to be here, even though there were a handful of things on my backstage rider that didn't get ironed out, so bear with me. You're seeing me without my usual pre-show tangerine-flavored oxygen and Greek yogurt plunge bath, but I think I think we're going to be okay. Let's do this. UVA is truly a magical place, founded by the great Dr. Dre and Ice Cube. I'm, <clears throat> I'm being told no, that is in WA, not UVA. Apologies. Um, my bad. Your founder, of course, is the great Thomas Jefferson who wrote that he hoped the university would attract talented students from other states to come and, quote, drink of the cup of knowledge. And students were like, you had me at drink. <laughs> As would be expected from an institution of this caliber, UVA has its share of famous and highly successful alumni, including Tina Fey, Edgar Allan Poe, and New York Jets offensive lineman DeBrick Shaw Ferguson. Which means the question, what do Tina Fey, Edgar Allan Poe, and DeBrickshaw Ferguson have in common actually has an answer. I did not know that. <laughs> it is uh, such a treat to be addressing you in front of the famous UVA Rotunda, which is now undergoing its fourth complete overhaul since its inception, making it the Rand Paul of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. <laughs> The best thing about Virginia is, of course, your state motto, Virginia is for lovers, which explains why the mottos of Maryland, West Virginia, and North Carolina are all, get a room. <laughs> when I was invited to speak to you today, it was pre pretty obvious to me what was going on, so I'm not going to stand here with false modesty and pretend I don't know the real reason I'm here. I get it. This is Virginia, and I play the banjo. I grew up here in the South, and yet despite having many friends who attended this great institution, uh, you might be surprised to know that my strongest tie to UVA is actually through show business. I was an actor on a sitcom called The Office for many years, and uh, in one episode, my acapella-obsessed character, Andy Bernard, brought his own a uh, college acapella group to Dunder Mifflin. This group was played by none other than your very own Virginia Hullabahoos. And we had a great time working together. Now, here's a slightly less well-known factoid. The wardrobe for Andy Bernard was actually inspired by student attire at the Foxfield races. <laughs> Interesting side note, Andy Bernard was also supposed to appear in one season of The Office, and then they were going to get rid of him. But I'm proud to say that due to the character's popularity, they decided to bring him back, which is why I feel a special kinship with President Sullivan who can best be described <laughs> I think we can all agree President Sullivan can best be described as the Andy Bernard of UVA. <laughs> Although I will point out Andy Bernard was eventually canceled along with the rest of the show, so don't get too cocky. 
I don't know if you're even aware of this, but uh, UVA has had quite an impact on Hollywood recently. It turns out that orange and blue are the new black. <laughs> and uh, the Virginia ABC officers were the inspirations for the Paul Blart Mall Cop movies. <laughs> a lot of people think it's strange that a school with 21,000 students should have close to 15,000 secret societies. But I think it's fabulous. As a Freemason and Templar Knight and member of the Illuminati, I feel very at home here. Incidentally, last night I either joined a secret society or I'm now legally married to a goat in a purple hood. One of my favorite UVA traditions is, of course, streaking, which I learned the hard way does not include attending the Boar's Head Inn Continental Breakfast arbitrarily nude. <laughs> A mistake I will not be making again. Or will I? Congratulations to the men's soccer team, national champions for the seventh year in a row. A great sports tradition here at UVA. Although, I gotta be honest, I feel like we could work on your mascot a little. You're the Cavaliers, and yet your mascot doesn't have a very Cavalier expression. I mean, you can't expect fans to leap to their feet and cheer when the mascot looks artsy and world-weary, like an emo Captain Morgan living paycheck to paycheck until his jam band makes it big. <laughs> Tomorrow, having worn the honors of honor, whatever the hell that is. <laughs> you will walk away from this university carrying with you invaluable knowledge, experience, and if you're lucky, the password to your roommate's Netflix account. <laughs> you will also have your esteemed UVA diploma, which I understand is absurdly large, one and a half by two feet to be exact. What in God's name are you compensating for? And where will you hang that? It's basically a highway billboard advertising uh, unemployment and crippling student loan debt. <laughs> the good news is for those of you who majored in comparative literature, your diploma can also serve as a tent for you to live under. <laughs> but enough about you. <laughs> what about me, right? Why am I here? Well, I'm speaking you t to you today because I'm a very brilliant and important person. How do I know this? Well, because I'm a celebrity. And celebrities are, by definition, brilliant and important, according to my agent. And of course, also deeply humble, according to my publicist. But I'd like to set the record straight because I feel that celebrities are often misunderstood. For example, people often try to de define me as callous and pampered, living in a bubble. <laughs> I am very resentful of this because I'm actually extremely grounded, which is why I have my vast legal team crush every last person who would say otherwise. <laughs> the simple truth is that celebrities are people too. I have my pants put on me one leg at a time, just like everyone else. <laughs> And I deal with my feelings the same way you do, by burying them deep inside under gallons of Ben and Jerry's while scrolling through Netflix titles, never quite committing to watching anything. <laughs> Those are some ways people try to define me. Here are some ways that people are trying to define you. You are millennials, which is the biggest generation in US history. I thought it was hard for me to find a job. It's gonna be like the Hunger Games out there for you guys. <laughs> They say millennials are uninterested in the burden of ownership and prefer to be part of the sharing economy, that you're exercising more, eating right, and using apps and data to track your health. They say you use built-in sonar to see in the dark and that your wings have tiny glands that produce a tawny, almost tobacco-like musk when you're frightened. <laughs> Some of these labels might fit, others seem like they might apply more to bats. The last one in particular, but at best, these generation descriptors are just an absurd reduction. So take note, as you go out in the world, you'll find that people are always quick to define you, to pigeonhole you, to whittle you down to their preconceived notions. Which brings me to my point. Never let others define you. Define yourselves. 
In 1997, Apple Computers was seen as, a, as well past its peak, and the prognosis was dire. In October of that year, Dell Computer CEO Michael Dell was asked, what would you do if you were Steve Jobs? He said, what would I do? I'd shut Apple down and give the money back to the shareholders. Well, do me a favor, reach into your pocket, take out your Dell phones and tweet that. <laughs> In 1991, I was applying to colleges, and my father suggested Vanderbilt. After all, he had gone there, so had my mom. It's a great school. And maybe after that, I could go to law school, just like he did, and then join a, a law firm in Atlanta. Wouldn't that be great? Well, no, not really. Because my idea of being a lawyer is being in a John Grisham movie. This was a major crossroads for me, a moment where I needed to de define myself. And thank God I did. I decided to attend a small artsy school, Oberlin College in Ohio, where I joined up with some bluegrass pickers and some improv comedy nerds, and those two things have shaped my life more than just about anything else. In 2008, I had spent close to five wonderful years on The Daily Show as a fake news correspondent. I wanted to act more, to do other things, but the TV community had already defined me. He's not an actor, he just does fake news. So I threw myself into a short film a friend was putting together and we worked our asses off on it. When that film landed on the office showrunner uh, Greg Daniels' desk, he saw me on my terms and suddenly I was in consideration for one of my favorite TV shows. Now I know the UVA community has some experience with being defined by outsiders. It has been said that a rolling stone gathers no moss. I would add that sometimes a rolling stone also gathers no verifiable facts or even the tiniest morsels of journalistic integrity. <laughs> rolling Stone tried to define you this year. As a result, not only was this community thrown deep into turmoil, but the incredibly important struggle to address sexual violence on campuses nationwide was suddenly more confusing than ever and needlessly set back. And sadly, Rolling Stone's rush to define is just the tip of the iceberg. We see it everywhere in the media. Less than three weeks ago, when Baltimore was erupting in violence, Aaron Burnett on CNN argued that a local resident insisting the, argued with a local resident insisting the rioters be defined as thugs. Wolf Blitzer did the same thing. Over on Fox News, reporter Nick Vittert prattled on about how violent the people of Baltimore were. But city councilman Nick Mosby wouldn't have it. In a, texty, tech, in a testy exchange, he defined his own community, saying, this is about the social economics of poor urban America. These young guys are frustrated, they're upset, and unfortunately, they're displaying it in a very destructive manner. When folks are undereducated, unfortunately, they don't have the same intellectual voice to express, to express it in the way other people do, and that's what we see through the violence today. That's a much bigger, more complex analysis, and it strikes me as the real news story. Either way, the reductive labels aren't helping, and we better stop applying them, because there are a lot of Americans in a lot of pain. Those riots weren't happening in Kiev or Benghazi. They happened a mighty pleasant three-hour drive from right here. So does all of this mean Aaron Burnett and Wolf Blitzer are bad people? I don't think so. We're all guilty of this. How many times do we label someone with our first impressions only to be proven wrong? The tattooed motorcycle guy who turns out to be a teddy bear, the buttoned up coworker who actually knows how to party, or the mousy librarian who takes off her glasses to reveal she's a bloodthirsty alien from a distant galaxy. <laughs> We try to define others with simple labels because it makes the world easier to understand. Behavioral economist and Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman explained this in his amazing book, Thinking Fast and Slow, in which he wrote, when faced with a difficult question, we often answer an easier one instead, usually without noticing the substitution. So clearly, other people are really bad at defining us, but, Sometimes, these can also be great opportunities to examine and learn about ourselves. This may sound contradictory, but F. Scott Fitzgerald famously said, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. And that's precisely what all of you did. This community didn't fall for the fallacy that just because Rolling Stone was wrong, everything here must be perfectly peachy. 
You all had the courage to understand you can be outraged at Rolling Stone and still ask yourselves some hard questions. When sexual violence does occur in our community, do we have the best possible protocols and resources available to our students? And UVA is charging forward to answer those questions, and you should be proud of that. <laughs> Questioning something doesn't mean you repudiate it. To the contrary, we should question most the ideas and institutions we cherish most. We can question a sitting president without disrespecting the office. We can question our foreign policy without, uh, while still supporting our troops. We can celebrate the honor and courage of our dedicated police while questioning some of their tactics. And of course, we can love our parents and respect their desires while charting our own courses. Sorry, moms and dads, but maybe that's a good one for you to hear too. It doesn't matter where you fall on the ideological spectrum. What matters is that you approach the world with humility, intellectual honesty, and an ongoing effort to understand the whole picture. If you need any more reason to be humble, there is a terrifying new study out by Yale Law Professor Dan Kahan and his colleagues that paints a very scary picture of how our minds work. I suggest looking it up, but the gist of it is that very smart people are confounded by very simple math problems when the results of the math problem challenge their politics. In other words, our beliefs make us irrational. Many of our most brilliant thinkers have had shocking blind spots, spaces where they chose to ignore what was right in front of them. Our founding fathers were obsessed with liberty, and yet, at the same time, they owned slaves. We can marvel at how blind they were, but maybe we should also ask ourselves, where are our blind spots today? Which of our positions will look equally absurd to generations to come? What are we rationalizing or refusing to see? In You Are Not So Smart, author David McRaney points out, there is a growing body of work coming out of psychology and cognitive science that says you have no clue why you act the way you do, choose the things you choose, or think the thoughts you think. That is terrifying. Apparently, we fight to stay idiots because the more we know and understand, the more we realize the world is just a confounding, infuriating place. So what now? Do we give up, give in to nihilistic defeatism, just throw our hands up and say, oh, well, I guess I'm an idiot and the world's a mess. Time for some Ben and Jerry's and Netflix. <laughs> Hell no. Realize that this is a wonderful gift of greater self-awareness and self-knowledge. It's not depressing, it's liberating. Pain, suffering, and ignorance make no sense, but guess what? Neither do beauty, compassion, and love. They're two halves of the same pomegranate, and whichever side you decide to chomp down on will define who you are. Remember what F. Scott Fitzgerald said? Whoa. <laughs> Apparently, Georgia Tech doesn't like this speech. <laughs> Where were we? It was really building momentum, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, oh yes, the pomegranate. <laughs> there are two halves of the same pomegranate, and whichever side you decide to chomp down on will define who you are. Remember what F. Scott Fitzgerald said? Well, this is the mother of all opposing ideas for you to hold in your head at the same time and still function. Here are a few more. The world is not a meritocracy, but merit still matters. The world isn't fair, but being fair still matters. The world is unkind, but being kind still matters, perhaps more than anything. We can't eliminate human nature from humanity, so we must embrace it, accept ourselves, the good, the bad, our brilliance, and our ignorance, and simply strive to improve. David Brooks, in a wonderful New York Times column titled The Moral Bucket List, uh, referred to this process as stumbling. He said, the stumbler doesn't build her life by being better than others, but by being better than she used to be. Ernest Hemingway put it another way, there is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow men. True nobility lies in being superior to your former self. Even Matthew McConaughey weighed in on this. 
in his Oscar acceptance speech for Dallas Buyers Club. He said, a person came to me and said, who's your hero? And I said, it's me in 10 years. Now, the media had a field day with this. They said, he's his own hero, what a narcissist. But that, that's way off base. That, that's actually a beautiful idea. He was defining who he wanted to be and then chasing after it. My compliments to Marco Rubio. <laughs> now, after digging deep, I realized that the person I really wanted to be is Matthew McConaughey. I mean, come on! <laughs> that Texas charisma just washes over you like warm pancake syrup. Who do you want to be? You are going to be defined whether you like it or not. The question is, will you let others do it for you? Or will you define yourselves? And remember, you can't just define yourselves with words. You can't write it in a journal or say it out loud. I am a wonderful person with exceptional character and a vaguely British accent. No, that does not cut it. We define ourselves by our actions, convictions, and responses to the world around us, and by the degree to which we take full responsibility for our lives. Now, whatever your backgrounds and wherever you're headed, you all have two things in common right now. You are graduating with a phenomenal education, and you are young. These two things combined give you immense power. They say with great power comes great responsibility. Not true. Responsibility is entirely optional. You can coast if you want to, but don't you dare coast. Ladies and gentlemen of the University of Virginia class of 2015, each and every one of you has a vibrant, courageous soul and a depth of power, creativity, and wisdom you are only just beginning to tap into. That is your light. It is the light within you, and you have to let it shine, because when you do, I promise, it will illuminate you your family, your friends, your community, your country, and the entire world. Don't let that light die. Every day, wake up and say to yourself, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Whoa, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Whoa, everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I'm gonna let. Congratulations! I'm really glad I get to follow that. It's... <laughs> We're so grateful that Mr. Helms could be with us today and for his inspiring words. Thank you so much, Mr. Helms.
My name is Will Laverack, and it's been one of the greatest honors and privileges of my life to serve as president of the class of 2015. If you're a fourth year, I know what you're thinking. There's no way the kid who knocked on my door four years ago, handing me a flyer featuring Victoria's Secret and Calvin Klein models and reading, where there's a will, there's a way, is still our class president. <laughs> yes, somehow it's true. But anyway, class of 2015, the weekend that has always seemed so far away is now here. And if you're like me, you're probably feeling a potent blend of emotions. A little Titanic's I'll never let go meets Whitney Houston's and I, I will always love you meets Anchorman's I'm in a glass case of emotion meets Game of Thrones's Winter is Coming <laughs> meets Castaway's Wilson meets the Terminator's I'll be back. You might even be feeling a little bit of Braveheart's freedom, although I think that's probably more common for those graduating from Virginia Tech. <laughs> think back to when you first set foot on these grounds. We were younger, obnoxiously driven, a little more naive and idealistic, and perhaps thinner and better looking. <laughs> we noticed there was something special about this place. After my first visit, I remember placing a Thomas Jefferson bobblehead that I'd bought at the school store on my bedside table. Each night before going to sleep, I'd look Mr. Jefferson in the eye and ask, will I get into UVA? I'd then quickly tap his head with my fingers to help him nod with confirmation. <laughs> I think we all wanted a nod, to use the metaphor. We wanted the university's gates to open up for us so that we could embark on our own personal journey. And when they did open, we began in similar predicaments. Many of, asked, many of us asked the same questions. Will I fit in here? Is academical a word? At what point is it too late to respectfully ask people to remind you of their name? Why are those students running down the lawn at this hour? And why did they leave extra pairs of clothes on the rotunda steps? Really, the good old song after a field goal? Why did the person swiping my ID in Newcomb call me baby? And is it okay if I really liked it? Who is Rafat Khan? Why is Halloween in Charlottesville the same length as Hanukkah? Mr. Jefferson is kind of demanding. You want me to spend two hours a day doing physical exercise? I don't see you getting off your little statue chair over there, Tom. We fought through these questions and many others, and over time the university has become not only where we are, but also who we are. Each of us finds UVA a little bit differently. Some find it in the intellectual sanctuary of a classroom. Some find it while performing in the beam of a spotlight or interweaving the mellifluous tones of an instrument. Some find it while sweat seeps through their jersey. Some find it while chanting go who's in the stands. Some find it in self-governance or in honor. Some find it looking through a microscope. Some find it in the smile of a child while volunteering. Some find it within the old walls of a fraternity or sorority house. Some find it in Charlottesville. Others find it halfway around the world. But no matter where we find it, what we find is ultimately pretty similar. And it can be hard to put into words. It can only really be felt felt in the beating of our hearts and the vivid flickers of yesterday in our minds. The way we felt when the person who was once a stranger became the person we'd do anything for. The way we felt when we chose to take the long way home just so we could walk across the lawn. The way we felt when a former hallmate smiled at us on our way to class, when we stayed up late belly laughing with friends, when we agreed that calorie consumption after midnight doesn't count. The way we felt at a lecture when we sat next to the student who seemed to be boycotting deodorant. The way we felt during that awful exam when we decided to come back to the question so many times that we ran out of questions. The way we felt at that party when we were sure we were dancing as well as Michael Jackson. The way we felt when this confidence was debunked the following morning by the Facebook documentation. <laughs> 
The way we felt when we played our last game, finished our last class, or watched the rotunda light up for the last time. The way we felt when this place started to feel like home, and then when it felt completely like home. The way we feel right now. Put these types of feelings together, and I think that's the UVA we've found. The UVA will remember. The UVA that unites us. And so at least for me, it's hard to reconcile with the fact that the point in which we've truly found UVA is also the point in which we have to leave. Are we ready to graduate? Perhaps the answer is the same as what a thesis advisor recently said to a fourth year regarding his thesis topic. Quote, this is a question you should leave to the tavern after several beers, since it can only be surmised at best. End quote. But I don't think that's the answer. I think we know the answer. I talked with an incoming first year a few weeks ago, and after speaking for a few minutes, she tilted her head and looked at me with a peculiar gaze, the type a puppy might give you when it's confused. You're kind of old, she said. <laughs> I responded, you better watch it, lady, or I will make it my life's mission to make sure you, get, you end up in Gooch Dillard. <laughs> Just kidding, I didn't say that. But she did call me old, and it got me thinking. When we were first years, the song Call Me Maybe consumed our lives. Justin Bieber was still struggling with prepubescence. Taylor Swift wasn't anywhere near the exuberant solipsism of Shake It Off. We are kind of old. And in the 195 weeks, 1,400 days, and 33,000 hours that we've been students here, we've soaked up UVA. How many more Bodo's bagels can we eat? How many more times can we high-five Dean Groves? How many more horses can we enthusiastically cheer on at Foxfield? How many more exams can we cram for? How many more humpback summits can we hike? How many more times can we watch the sun peek its head over the east side of the lawn? How many more events can we plan or concerts can we perform? How many more snow days, sunny days, happy days can we cherish? How many more moments can we relish? We all wish we had one more chance, one more day, one more hour to do all of these things. But in our hearts, we know we've done them, that we've lived this place. We know that when we look in the mirror on the morning of graduation, we're gonna see a different person than the one who needed the university years ago. A different person than the one who topped that bobble, tapped that bobblehead of Mr. Jefferson with the purest form of hope that he or she could become part of this. We have been part of this. And this weekend, when we look that bobblehead in the eye and ask him if we're ready to graduate, as much as we want to resist it, we have to tap his head and help him nod. Because it is time, and we are ready. And that's what makes this weekend not just one of celebration, but also one of pain. While the university has given us wings, it has also given us roots. And for many of us, it hurts to fly away, especially from the people and things we've grown to love. It tears at the heartstrings that we've worked for so long to tightly weave, but they will not break, and we don't have to relinquish them. They can't be cut by a diploma, or a boxed up room, or a new job, or a new city, or new friends. Ultimately, no matter where we go or how far apart we are, they will bind us with this place and with each other eternally. And there's no doubt that our class joined this university at a particularly trying time. And I think it's quite fitting that our experience here began with an earthquake. Indeed, as a class and as a university, we've faced challenges that have shaken us. I know there's frustration maybe even some anger out there. But I also know that it is outweighed by belief. Belief in who we are as individuals, as a class, and as a university. Belief in our ability to weather any storm. And belief in the progress that we relentlessly pursue. Perhaps as a kid, you read of Shel Silverstein's The Star Polisher. Somebody has to go polish the stars. They're looking a little bit dull. Somebody has to go polish the stars, for the eagles and starlings and doves are all complaining they're tarnished and worn. 
Somebody has to go polish the stars. In every instance, the class of 2015 has heeded this call. And in my view, that is our legacy. We came when the university needed us the most. We entered a community that's in one way similar to all communities, scattered with both perfections and imperfections, some foreseeable, some unpredictably passing through on a breeze. We will graduate, but the legacy we leave here will not. And down the road, when we look back on our time, I know in our hearts we'll be able to say not only that we wore the honors of honor, but that we were the mothers and fathers of an era that polished the stars and made the constellation of this university shine bright. Congratulations, class of 2015. Have a fantastic weekend, and we'll see you at the class party tonight.